Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi. I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of this uh, fascinating series, The Search for Muhammad. In fact, um, uh, so far, uh, we have presented evidence upon evidence to show that there are, uh, and literally, I I'm not making fun of this phrase, there are a lot of holes in the early narrative about Muhammad alone. And therefore, we are presenting to you, we, myself, Dr. J. Smith here with me, who will join me shortly right now, presenting evidence to you. It is incumbent upon you now, whether you are a Christian, whether you are a Muslim, whether you are a doubter, a seeker, an atheist, you call yourself whatever you want, to go and inspect the data. Don't make conclusions or reach uh, basic, make decisions and reach conclusions just based on emotions. There are much more than emotions being presented here. There are facts and there are data that you are more than able to go and examine it for yourself, uh, search it for yourself, and also ask questions on your own. We want to make sure that these things are helpful to all of you. We're not hoarding it back, by the way. Unfortunately, in the academic field, there is a lot of these data that we're sharing with you that are found only inside books that if unless you know about the book, you won't be able to find it yourself. That's why we want it to be out there. And the idea here is to help you, if you're a Muslim, to realize that the notion that everything you believe in is founded on a lie is just that. Everything you know is founded on lies, plural. I say this as an ex-Muslim. My heart aches for all of you. I want you to have the privilege of at least knowing that there is truth out there. There is way to heaven out there, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do. With that in mind, today we are going to talk about Petra, or at least let's say we're going to revisit Petra and all of the plethora that it brings our way. Dr. J, what about Petra? Okay, we have talked, and we've done a whole series, haven't we, on just on Petra, Dan Gibson's right. material. and We, we just uh, launched uh, one of them, and it's going like wildfire. Okay, so this is a fascinating thing. We have been talking about Dan Gibson for a lot of times. We did a, we did a whole series on it. Uh, you have it on Sierra International. I have also done it on Fander Films after you guys. And what's fascinating is people came back w completely gobsmacked. Uh, and Gibson's material just was revolutionary because he was the first one to actually do what, well, actually what we're doing, and that is to actually go to the place, go to this institute and ask the questions where the evidence lies. And he just looked at the evidence, being a good archaeologist, his father was an archaeologist, his grandfather was an archaeologist, and now we're coming back to that paradigm again. We need to talk about Petra. Because remember, we, in the last episode, we talked about Ilyas Ibn Kabisa moving to Petra after he'd taken care of all the negotiations, had changed sides from first supporting the Sassanians to then, uh, then going against them, and then being arbiter between the Jews and the Lachmids, which, which he was belonged to. Uh, he then became an arbiter to them, solidified his power there, and then moved to the west, moved over towards Petra. Let's bring up Petra again. And what do we know about Petra? Well, remember what Gibson said. Gibson is very clear that Petra is where all the Umayyads faced to for their sanctuary. So that would include Mu'awiyah, that would include all those that came before Mu'awiyah uh, from 620, 630, 640. We can't find their names because they're not Abu Bakr. Umar, Uthman, or Ali. Those names are not found in any of the coins or the rock inscriptions, but they are talking about they are talking about God, and they are talking using his name Allah, and they are referring to a place that they pray to, and that's where Gibson found that all the places, all the mosques, all, and these would have been temples before they were called mosques. These were temples as far away as Guangzhou in China, and in Sherman in India, and down in, down in the Hedramat area, up in Turkey, in Syria, Jordan, all these places, even in Israel, they're all facing right to Petra. Petra, which is there in Jordan, which is just about 100 miles southeast of where Jerusalem is today. Did they have a religion associated with this practice? And if indeed uh, there was one, do we know what it's called? Absolutely. And this is why this is fascinating, because that religion had, they had what they called uh, practices 
that we're being uh, that we're being engaged with and the reason why petra is so important is because it was the center of the nabataean empire and the nabataeans were traders that went all over the world they were the only ones that could cross the desert we remember we talked about it how they used the stars to be able to see exactly how to get to the next oasis and from that oasis to the next oasis and they used the north star with the the cabal the block they would use the string to find out how many steps they were going to how many tens of thousands of steps using poetry and then they would use Use from east to west, they would use 32 different stars to find the east to west directions. Again, going and using this poetry to be able to find exactly where the next oasis was. Many times that had uh, that had been covered over by different dunes, sand dunes, and but they knew that those were their oasis, and that's how they were to survive and get across the deserts to places like India and all the way over to China. Because of that. Every time that they were there, they would always then set up, usually leave a family there to be the, tar be the arbiter for their trade whenever the trade, the camels would come. But they had to, those who were there in those different cities would put together temples. They would erect temples with the Qibla. That would mean they would have erect temples with the Qibla facing their sanctuary. And all those Qiblas is what Dan Gibson looked at. And that's why he was the first to do that. He started in 1979, all the way up to 904. He was looking at these Qiblas, going to them, and he noticed that they were all facing this place called Petra. That's why he said, well, goodness sakes, universally, up until 706, they're only facing Petra. Muhammad died in 632. These temples, and, or, which became mosques, uh, when, the, when the Muslim then imposed their, their name on it, these temples were all facing their Nabataean Petra all the way up to 706. They were within 1.9 degrees off from thousands of miles away. That's how accurate they were. That's because they could use the stars. Now, when he went to Petra then, he said, let's take a look at this Petra. There must be something significant about Petra. And listen, many tourists go to Petra today because you have all those amazing buildings that are carved out of sheer rock. That's right. These rock, beautiful temples and Mansions. burial chambers. Right. So it's for tombs and temples. Right. It's a city of tombs and temples because whenever you died, you went and you would you would die there, or your body would be buried in your family tomb, and that's why yes, even Kabisa went there. He went to Petra basically because he was in retirement. If you're in retirement, you know you're going to die. What better place than to Petra? Now, what Dan Gibson noticed is that when you go to Petra you suddenly come across the very things that Muslims use in the, what they call the Hajj today, the pilgrimage. So let's look at the slide and see what he found. They needed a place uh, to create their pilgrimage. And they needed a place basically to do the Hajj. So let's take a look and see what we found. Petra has all the stations of the pilgrimage which are now found in Mecca. Ooh, that's interesting. Let's look at them. The first one, the Kaaba. The Kaaba is in Petra. What's fascinating, Gibson went and looked at Azraki's writings in the traditions, and Azraki refers to the Kaaba, and he refers to the dimensions of the Kaaba. How many, how many, uh, how many feet or whatever the the the. the I don't know, I, and off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what kind of measurement they use. But what he said, when you look at those measurements, they exactly fit the Kaaba that there is in Petra. Probably they use the Ra. When you go and look at how many dera there arms, are in yeah. Mecca, it doesn't fit the, what is Zachary saying, suggesting to me and very and so, I'm sorry, suggesting to Gibson that the one in Mecca is the wrong Kaaba. Now you say, hold on a minute. There could only be one Kaaba. That's the Kaaba in Mecca. No, 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 no. There were Kaabas in every city. Yeah, there are Hitti, Kaabas, yeah. Hitti, the historian noticed that way back in the last century. He said there was reference to a Kaaba in Tabuk, in Khaibar, in right. uh, there in Taif. They had Kaabas everywhere that there was an oasis where the caravans would go up and down the western plateau. There was a Kaaba because you would want to make sure that people would come and get protection for the next stage of the journey. You would then give money to the Kaaba. They, that's Square. And sometimes they were just square enclosures, sometimes they were buildings, and in every case there were Kaabas. So this is not unique to Mecca. It's just that this has become unique to Mecca since the Abbasid period. Once the Abbasids came to power, they are the ones that erected Mecca as the sanctuary. But prior to Mecca, there was Petra. Petra had the exact same dimension that Azaki refers to the Kaaba. So that's the first thing. Let's look at the slide again, and let's go to the next thing. The next thing he found there was that there was these hills that supposedly Hagar ran back and forth through to look for water for her son Ishmael when that's she was right. in the desert. Now, if Hagar did this, it makes sense that she did it that north. 
because that's real close to Israel where they would have been. That's where Abraham lived. And she was fleeing from Abraham because of her son Ishmael was causing problems for Isaac. And therefore she fled into the desert. Where do you think she would have fled to? She would have fled to Jordan, the desert. And it looks like she fled to here. And that's the two mountains. And it refers to mountains, right? Now, that's the idea. There are two mountains. In fact, when I go there, uh, when I went there to do the Sa'i between the Safa and Marwa, yeah, th- there is a remnant of a mountain here and a remnant of a How mountain How tall there. are they? Well, I mean, it's not that tall anymore. Have you seen the pictures? Uh, yeah, I mean... They're, they're only about 15 they're, to 20 feet high. Yeah, yeah, they're not that high at all. Is that a mountain? Uh, no, but they tell you this is a remnant of the mountain that was <laughs> a there. Remnant. It's a facsimile, right. meaning that there was, an, there was an original one. Right. Where do you think the original one is? Well, now we know where it is. Gibson has found them. They are called Safa and Marwa. They are two complete different mountains. And on the top of them are not only temples, but there's also a church sitting on top of them that are pre-Islamic to commemorate that event. That's in Petra. What they have recreated in uh, Mecca are nothing more than facsimiles of the very thing that originally was in Petra. So there's the Safa and Marwa looking for water is found in Petra with places for idols at the top and not little rocks as we find in Mecca. Let's go to the third thing they found. Remember, it says that they that they washed. They had to, they were there was streams going through, and there's reference after reference in the traditions about the place where the prophet lived. That there were streams, that there were water wells, there was the Zamzam well. All these waterways and cisterns, they are not in Mecca, whatever. When you go to Petra, and Gibson shows picture after picture. In fact, there was a it was just a documentary that came out about a week ago. Judy, my wife, and I were watching this. Uh, there up in Pennsylvania, and we were looking at this documentary, and we noticed that when you look at the Petra today, you can see the cisterns along the cavern wall. They had built these long, long waterways. They're still there today. That goes to wells. Where did that water come from? It came from cisterns out in the desert. They have now found where the source of all this water is. What you see in the traditions concerning this city it had, fits Petra exactly. There is no such thing in Mecca at all. There are no right. cisterns. There are no waterways. There's only one well called the Zumzum well, which is the name that is given to it because that was in Petra to begin with. It was then recreated there in Mecca at a much later date, just like they recreated Safa and Marwa, just like they recreated the Kaaba. Am I correct on this? Yeah. So can you see this is a much smaller facsimile of what was bigger in Petra, yet it's the same stage. Let's go back to the slide again, and let's look at what they also found. Also, the plain of Muzdalifa, a slippery slope mountain with a mosque and a church at the top, which could accommodate up to 5,000 people and could pray, is also found in Petra. In fact, it makes more sense in Petra because it's bigger than the one that they have now in Mecca. Now, do they uh, d- did Gibson discover any pillars representing Satan? Here we or... go. That's the next one. You right. jumped ahead of me. Right. That's number five. The Jamarat platform. Right. That they have found. You can see the base of it. It is there. It is right there in Petra. Now stop and ask yourself, how many pillars are there in Mecca? Three. How many g- devils are there? Well, there's one only. Exactly. So why do they have three in Mecca and yet only one in Petra, which is more, cl- which is closer to the theological set precept of God, of God versus the devil? Well, I can tell you the way they're going to respond back. They say, well, the journey that Abraham took was three days, and therefore every time he was stoning him, it was in a different location. Okay, that's the later tradition of right. trying to make sense of that. Right. It's obviously those stones, those pillars were there pre-Islamic. They are probably Meccan. They're, and Mecca was chosen for a reason because it looked like it was a pagan place of worship. Those Jamarats existed prior to Islam. But the Jamarat that should be there should only be one if there's only one devil, and that is found in Petra. Could it be, could it be, uh, Jay, uh, that, uh, you know, you hear about uh, one of the chief idols in Mecca, his name is Hubal. You know, I grew up believing uh, uh, that there was an idol called Hubal, which later uh, I discovered it was named after Habaal. You know, see, Hubal, Habaal, you know. And the idea is like somebody was in Syria, was fascinated by Baal, brought a small statue, and they built one. Could it be that some people in Arabia went, visited these places, and they wanted to commemorate it when they went back home? You're talking about for the Jamarats now? Right. You're talking about, you know, listen, I would suggest that no. I would no. suggest that these are these are authentic, that they were there, they're pre-Islamic, because who is the one that goes down there? Who is the one that actually creates Mecca? You have to give it, you have to put it to, at the feet of Zubair. Even Zubair, who rebelled against Abd al-Malik, he was the governor of Petra. That is historical. We do know that it existed. He lived in Petra. When he rebelled against Abd al-Malik, he destroyed Petra. He destroyed the Kaaba. He destroyed the, uh, the, the Jamarat. And the most important 
important thing is he took the black stone. So he wanted to divert everything down south. He didn't want to. He just do it. He did. He was. This is where he rebelled. But he took the black stone with him. When you take the black stone with you, you take God's presence with you. Remember that. It's almost that. like the Ark of the Covenant. It's idea. like the Ark of the Covenant, and this black stone. And we haven't even put the video up, so I'm not going to introduce it at this point. That's yet to come in January. We have now found out an enormous amount of history about that black stone. Elagabalus. Remember the name Elagabalus. We're going to come back to that. But in taking the black stone with him down to, to the south, where do you think he went to? He went to where he came from. He went to the south, and when he took the black stone, the pilgrims started following him. So the pilgrims no longer went to Petra anymore because they wanted to go where the black stone was. That's why Zubair needed help. And so that's why he then turned towards the Abbasids who were in Stesiphon, which is Baghdad today. I said, reminding people, that's Baghdad today. They were the ones that hated the Umayyads. They wanted nothing to do with the Umayyads. They were still the, the, the remnant of the Sassanids who had been destroyed by the Byzantines. They are the ones that are up there. They want to get back in power again. They're getting stronger and stronger. They see an advantage by be taking and becoming an ally with Zubair. They, they are the ones then then choose and place and say, this is now the new sanctuary. But once you have to create a new sanctuary, then you've got to then create the Kaaba again. That's why they rebuilt the Kaaba. And that's why you then have to have the Zamarat. You have to have the Muzdalafa uh, uh, plains. You also have to have the water. That's why they put this, the Zamzam well, because there is no waterway there. They just recreated what was already in Petra. They recreated in a smaller facsimile there in what is Mecca today. So that was done by the Abbasids. That was done because of Zubair. He was the one that had the black stone. The Umayyads were still doing that. You're correct. But remember, the Umayyads were up in Damascus. They were the ones that, are there, that were still looking to towards Petra. The Abbasids, once they ally with Zubair, they start saying, come to us, come to us, come to us, forget about them. And then you have someone like Al-Hajjaj. Al-Hajjaj, who is living in Kufa, he's the governor there in Kufa, he rebels against Abd al-Malak, and that's why his mosques now face in between Petra and Mecca, halfway in between. There's nothing right. there for talk them to about point that at. Before. Yeah. It's just a piece of sand. Right. There's no right. building there, there's no town there, there's he, no he hamlet there. He wanted to be politically correct. It's politically correct because <laughs> he's hedging his bets. He's waiting to see who's going to win out in this struggle between the Abbasids and the Umayyads. Now, once the uh, uh, Abbasids win out, then Mecca becomes important, then Mecca becomes the sanctuary. But that doesn't happen until around 749. And that's why you notice after 749, more and more the mosques are now facing Mecca. It doesn't, it takes till the next century to the ninth century till all the mosques are facing Mecca. This is what you would expect in a political uh, tussle that's going between two, two different empires. Two different empire empires that hated each other, one that's headquartered in Damascus, the other one that's headquartered in what is then Sestafan, which then in the ninth century becomes Baal. That. And then once they uh, uh, gain their power, the Abbasids, they then make Mecca as the official sanctuary. So with all these different Jamarats, now let's look, and I want to look at some maps and notice this. Look at these maps. I did this map. This is a map that's nothing more than a facsimile. Take a look at that map. Do you notice um, where the question mark is is where Mecca is? You notice Mecca is not there? That's right. But what is there? Well, take a look at that map. You notice Mecca is not there? Petra is there. Petra is there, up in the north. You see it? That's right, yeah. Both of these maps. Let's go back to this one. See Petra up there? Yes. Petra Notice there. where all the trade routes go through? It makes sense. Yeah. They go through Petra, right? Mecca's not there. Mecca's not there. Mecca is where that question mark is there. Now take a look at this map. Where is Mecca? It's, this is an official map, right? I'm showing you an official map. This is from the 6th century. So this is before Muhammad existed. This is before Muhammad lived. But remember the Muslims are telling us that Mecca was the center of the history of mankind, because that's where Adam and Eve were sent to. This is where Abraham lived. Then why is it not on this map in the sixth century? Right. Let's look at another map. Here's another map from the seventh century. Do you see Mecca there? No, that's where the question mark is. Where is Mecca? Like, where's Waldo? Mecca's not there in the seventh century. Let's look at this map here. Here's another map from the seventh century. These are maps from the seventh and sixth century, not facsimiles that are redacted back. Take a look, Mecca is missing in every one of these maps. And then you get to this one here. I'm going to give you one more, the 7th century map. Now, what we need to ask is, why did Mecca become important? Why, if it's not on any map? Well, here is where Montgomery Watt comes in. Montgomery Watt gives us the answer. And he says, when you look at Mecca, you realize, now this is a map, this is a famous map that, was, that has been made in the 20th century, looking back and what they, the 20th century scholars thought 7th century looked like. Okay? So remember, this is a modern map that we're looking at now. That a lot of the a lot of the historians in the actually 20th century, not 21st century, looking back on the 7th century. So you can see Stesiphon there. Can you see Stesiphon? That's where Baghdad is today. Uh, you can see Mecca is there because they thought Mecca was there. 
Montgomery walks back in the last century said, in order to understand why Mecca became important, you have to look and see where all the trade came from. Well, initially the trade came from the western coast of India there and went across the Arabian Sea up into the Persian Gulf, see where the black arrow is going. Right. And from there, it then was dispersed over across what is today Iraq and Syria over to the Mediterranean world because the trade needed to get from India to the Mediterranean world. And that's where all the trade went. That's what he said. However, in the fifth and sixth century, you had these great, the Sassanians here and the Byzantines. Now, some reason I'm not getting the right stuff. Something's gone wrong with this. That should be in yellow so you can see it. But can you read the word Sassanian there? Yes, yes. And can, can you read the it. word Byzantine there? Yes. There yes. should be a yellow background behind it so you can really stay and stands out. So those are the two it, great yeah. empires. Those are the yeah. Persian empires there in the east and the Christian empire there in the north. They were started warring with each other which is all historical. Right. When that happened, that shut down the Persian Gulf. They could no go across, they could no longer go so across they Arabia. Make a southern They've uh, got route. to go in your, another way. So what did he say? Well, this is where they went. They went across the Arabian Sea down to Aden down here, right? And then from here, they went right up all the way up to Gaza in the north. But it doesn't make sense. Hold on a minute. What do you mean it doesn't make sense? That makes sense to me. Why would they take the Red Sea? Okay, so this is what Patricia Crone said. But remember, Montgomery Watt, is, Montgomery Watt is doing this in the, ninth, uh, the 20th century, 1900s, 100 years ago. And everybody has tied into this route, trade route theory. Nobody bothered to look at a map until Patricia Corona did in 1987. She said, hold on a minute. And you notice something right away. Now, you've heard this because we've talked about it. That's why you've jumped to that conclusion. My 10-year-old son, who didn't know what you know, he looked at that and said, well, Daddy, why didn't they just go up the Red Sea? That's what Patricia Corona asked. Why didn't they just go up the Red Sea? Because when you look here, you'll notice, and she found out, that if you take a ton of goods on land, 100 miles, it's the same as taking a, that same ton of goods by ship, 1,250 miles. I mean, exactly. Same and, price. And you can make stops along the way at ports, and then from there, they'll take it to the... You don't even need to. You can go the whole way. 1,250 miles is easy to go in one go. And all you're using is wind to push you. You don't have to feed the camels. You don't have to protect the camels. You don't have to go from night to night, staying overnight, and paying all the dues and all the taxes and do playing at the Kabas at each one of these towns. None of that exists. You don't have to worry about decoits. You don't have to worry about any security. You can just go right up the ocean, right up the sea. Why didn't they take the sea? So she decided to go back and do something about it. She also noticed something else. Take a look at this more carefully. Now, let's uh, zero in on uh, the Arab Peninsula, and let's look at Aden down here. If they were going from Najran to Sana up to Taif, that's the, where you see the black arrows, that's all along the Western Plateau. At Taif then, suddenly, what the Muslim traditions are telling us and what Montgomery Walk is telling us, they suddenly took a detour down off the plateau, down to Mecca, which is a thousand meters down off the plateau. If, if no one knows where Taif is and never took a drive uh, there, they will know that this is the most obnoxious idea to bring animals that steep. Way down there to a place that had no water. Remember, yeah. there's no water in Mecca. There's only one Zamzam well. They have to f bring the water in from other sources from all over because it's the most arid place on earth. Well, one of the most arid, not the one. Then from there, they'd have to go back up a thousand meters to get up to Yathrib, which is the archaic name from for what is today Medina. And then from there, they would go up to Aden in the north. Now, she said, hold on a minute. Why hadn't anybody looked at this before? I have been there. She's not been to Mecca. She can't do because she's not a believer. But she has spent a lot of her time. She knows, she knows all about this. She says, has anybody looked at topography? You realize that this doesn't make sense topographically. So therefore, what she decided to do, she decided, well, let's go and see if, it did, if they did go maritime. Now, remember, she reads and writes 15 languages. So she could go back to all the original documents. And she went to the documents from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, all the way up until the 6th and 7th century. And she read them in the original language. And this is what she found. Look at this map here. These tra this trade went across the Arabian Sea. That is true from China, from India, across the Arabian Sea, over not to Aden, not there. It went right up through here up through the Gulf there, over to Eritrea, which is there. The Mendup Strait, and then they went up there. There mm -hmm. went, and it was the Eritreans whose names are all on the trading documents. There are no Arab names on any of these documents, for one very good reason. Look at the coast of Arabia, and there aren't many ports there. There are today, but not archaically. There aren't right. rare, because most and Arabs are camel herders. They're desert people. They're not seafaring people. And, and yeah, the Quran even talks about a, a, a caravan trip during the fall and the winter, and that caravan trip would have went all the way north and came back, meaning they go all the way to a northern location to buy their goods and stuff and come back again to Mecca. 
Yeah. <laughs> Why would they do this if it was passing through them? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see, historically speaking, and she did a great job in that book, in Mechantrain, The Rise of Islam in 1987, got a death threat for writing that, and that's why she left Oxford University and went up to Cambridge because of that. Because and what was her crime for getting a death threat? She just looked at the original documents, read them in their original language, and found out that the whole trade route theory was absolutely right. uh, fraudulent. So let's now look at those maps again that I showed you earlier. Let's repeat, retreat, and what do we know about those maps? Well, notice Mecca is not there, but what is there. Petra is there. Right. Notice in this map, Mecca is not there, but what is there? Petra is there. Let's look at this map. Mecca is not there, but what is there? Petra is there. Let's look at this map from the 7th century. Mecca is not there, but Petra is there. Indeed. So what do we now know about Petra? Let's take a look and let's review. Notice what we have found. Petra is the ancient sanctuary city of tombs and temples, all right? That's what Gibson found. That's what Gibson has shown us now. We now know that Petra is absolutely important. It is on all the trade routes, east and west, and also north. You notice there's no trade routes going south of Petra. Right. If there was trade routes going south of Petra, they would go through, hopefully, Mecca. The only trade routes that Patricia Crown found that went south of Petra were nothing more than leather and milk. There is trade along those oases like Tabuk and Chaibar do come up in the documents. Yathrib comes up in the documents quite often because in Stesiphon, which is what is today Baghdad, well, you see where Baghdad is there? That used to be called Stesiphon. They sent, uh, they sent uh, researchers way down to what, the, it says Medina today, it was called Yathrib back then, mm -hmm. and they found silver mines, and they, they had silver mines there. Look how close Medina is to Mecca. If they had silver mines there, why is it that they go down to Taif, which is southeast of that, but they don't know where Mecca is. Oh, they talk about Taif, they talk about Tabuk, these Stesiphonians, uh, these people from uh, the, from what is to then them were Persians. They talk about it, but they don't say one word about Mecca, she noticed. Not one of them. So what's fascinating, the trade route, as you do know, did not go through Mecca. It went through where the Green Arrow is going. See where the Green Arrow is going? It was maritime. And that's why her book was so devastating. Because she looked at it, and she noted that they these that Petra is where the Nabataean Aramaic is also introduced. That is where the Quranic Arabic is introduced. The Quran, the Arabic that we have in the Quran today is from Petra. So not only is it where all the trade goes through, it's also where the Quran was introduced, the Quranic Arabic that was then used to create the Quran later on. Petra is also where the mosques of all the Qiblas are facing up until 706, uniquely are facing there. They continue to be facing there even after, but all of them only face towards Petra. So the conclusion, it seems that Petra seems to have been the original sanctuary, which became Mecca, or I should say, not the word Mecca. It became Mecca then took on its role during the Abbasid period. Note that Petra is much too far north to support the later traditions once again. Now, let's remind ourselves before people get all out of balance. Let's remind ourselves that Petra versus Jordan versus, uh, versus Iraq. Are we getting two conflicting or two complementary and sequential scenarios? No, they are not conflicting. They are complementary and they're sequential. Iraq concerns politics, the Quran, and the theological debates that come from the 8th and 9th century. Petra in Jordan concerns really only the Qiblas, the direction of prayer, and the mosque. And I would also suggest it also concerns Ilyas ibn Kabisa from the early 7th century. Iraq both precedes Petra and then returns following Petra. What do I mean by that? Iraq is important between 577 and 636 AD. That's what we're known as the quest for Muhammad. That's the material we're looking at today. Uh, I mean, these episodes. Petra is important between 626 and 727. That's where the Qiblas, where Dan Gibson's material has shown, that there's, these are all much too far north. Iraq then becomes important again from the 8th century, from 736, when the Qir'ats start to appear right. with uh, this Qir'at here of Ibn Amir. And then continuing on with the Qur'ans. Remember, that's also where the manuscripts are starting to appear. So when we look at Petra versus Mecca, we shouldn't say them as, as competing. They are complementary. One precedes the other. That's wonderful, brother. Uh, what should we expect uh, next time? We're going to end off, we're going to get to the conclusions in our last episode. And what I want to do is I want to remind people of how, what we've been saying all the way through. We're looking at two complete different pl uh, areas of the map and two complete different period, di periods uh, on the timeline. We need to look at the dates. We need to look at the map. When you look at the map, you will see that everything that is important to Islam as we know it is all in the north. 
nothing of it is in heart, or I should say, very little of it is in the South. After some of this, all of it's attributed to the South, but we can't find it historically in the South. Also, what we're going to find is everything we know about Islam today is not from the 7th century it's all, or even the 8th century. It begins to be introduced in the mid-8th century, but it really begins to introduce in the 9th and 10th century. So too far north and too late. Wonderful. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. We can't make these quality videos without the help of partners like you. So please consider becoming a Patreon supporter today at patreon.com forward slash Sierra International. I want to make sure you always get notified when we release a new video. So please click the bell to be notified. And of course, make sure to subscribe to this channel. If this video was helpful to you, please click the thumbs up. Thank you.